So yesterday I went ahead and dug back into another Shutter film um, and decided that I would give a, another Giallo film a shot. Uh, I watched um, Stage Fright a couple weeks ago and uh, I liked it quite a bit. And so I was like, all right, you know, that one was a 80s movie that was heavily influenced by, you know, a global horror icon internationally, uh, Mr. Dario Argento. Um, and so why not actually watch some source material, you know? If I, uh, let me watch this, this movie Deep Red from uh, the mid-70s and see, you know, okay, this is probably what Michael Suave uh, took influence from when he made Stage Fright. Um, and this was the uh, first uh, Dario Agenter film that I, that I think I've actually watched, now that I think about it. Um, because, you know, Italian horror, you, you've got guys like Argento, you've got Lucio Fulci, um, and, and I can't really think of many other, you know, types. Uh, I know, it, you know, in Asian horror, you've got like kaijus and stuff, but like other European horror, I can't necessarily think of any that stand out more than Italian giallo, or giallo, Italian giallo films. God, I can't talk. Um, and I know Lucio Fulci, you know, zombie is not a giallo film, but you know, obviously giallos are awesome because they are essentially slashers with more glitz and glamour and just in general a, a neater, more polished look that actually focuses on plot more and like how the film is shot and, and, and things like that. It's like a, an art. If, if, a slasher, if a slasher fan and a art nut had a baby basically, uh, which is cool. You know, I, I'm not uh, the biggest critic when it comes to, you know, color palette aesthetic, but it's, you know, it's a, it's a welcome, a welcome uh, addition, I guess. And, you know, it, it's another part of a, of a horror movie that you can appreciate, which is not necessarily something you get with a lot of traditional, you know, 80s American slashers or just honestly 80s American horror in general. Um, but yeah, no, obviously... Dario Gento, known for you know Tenebrae, he did Suspiria. Never seen, never seen those. You know, no heard of them, obviously, um, and they are highly praised. Um, and this is considered one of his classics. I didn't really know that going in. All, all I knew is that it was a Dario Argento movie. Um, and you know, the log line itself, um, you know, is essentially talking about. It's a psychic who ends up, um, you know, at a show, ends up um, sensing a murderer in the crowd, and that gets her in the line of fire. Um, and there is a man who witnesses her um, preceding murder, um, and he, in turn, entrenches himself within that. Um, and it's essentially a, a murder mystery. Uh, if you will, and um, you know, I, I ha wasn't necessarily aware of all of the tropes of a giallo. Um, obviously, slasher films have their fair share of tropes, uh, and you know, giallos do as well, and they have a fair few of tropes because of classics like this movie. You know, because um, you've got the awesome cinematography. You know, you've got all kinds of beautiful color palettes, some really cool shots, like some really cool wide shots, uh, in particular in the kind of the, the nighttime, um, I guess it's a city setting outside like the pub or whatever, outside of uh, our main character's apartment building, uh, whenever he is talking to his friend, uh, Carlo, uh, there's that like big, um, sculpture i guess um and i don't know it was just really cool and it's some shit you would not see in a uh an 80s slasher right uh, or any slasher honestly for that fucking case um but you have all of that really cool camera work and just really just i don't know very um uh, really like potent and and cool camera work that that does leave an impact uh contrasted with violence 
gore that is quite literally top notch and ahead of its time. You know, this movie was made in Italy, so it is, you know, completely separate from the Western society. As hard as that, you know, might seem um, uh, as somebody like me, especially when I don't really know if it's considered dubbed, but, you know, obviously a lot of the characters have English accents, American accents, and so on and so forth. But, you know, you think of a movie from this time period with really good gore effects, Tom Savini, right? Well, this movie was before Tom Savini's time. And, um, I mean, you want to talk about the decapitation scenes. You want to talk about a motherfucker's head getting run over at the very end. Like, the gore, the blood itself looks very fake. I will admit that. Um, but they do a damn good job for the time period. Um, and it just, I don't know, everything looks really fucking good. Everything looks really, really good. And that's, once again, a hallmark of the Giallo. Um, and this is like essentially what they say. And I didn't know this till afterwards, till I kind of to read up about this, this movie because I don't know much about, you know, Italian horror. But this is kind of like in the way that Friday the 13th and the burning and Halloween were, you know, hallmark founding father, if you will, of the slasher genre. That's essentially what Deep Red was in 1975 for the Italian giallo genre. Um, but, uh, you know, the gore is great. Um, and then obviously you've got the villainous character in which you don't see the identity of uh, until the very end, right? Uh, which I guess is kind of, kind of uh, similar to, to slasher, right? Um, and, you know, throughout this movie, a lot of it is hinged upon... You know, it's like a murder mystery. You're trying to figure out who is the one who is murdering all of these people. Um, and, you know, ultimately it ends up kind of being a twist. And it, and it did leave me surprised um, because honestly, th throughout the movie, I was not sure who it could have been um, because it didn't lead me to believe that the killer was in fact somebody that was part of the cast that you would see regularly, something like, uh, you know, what Scream does generally. Um, but ultimately, you know, the killer, spoiler alert, um, ends up being the Carlo character who is our protagonist, basically best friend. It uh, ends up being his mother um, who is crazy, uh, who at the very beginning of the film, you see a very brief moment First thing you see on screen uh, where she kills her husband in front of the character Carlo and, you know, obviously, you know, she's she's crazy and then goes on to end up becoming the one who, you know, racks up the body count. And, you know, at the end, Carlo um, is presumed to be the killer, but um, our protagonist finds that out. And essentially he was just trying to cover up for his mother, who was the killer. And I don't know, I mean, I guess if you really look back and kind of piece it together and watch it again, it, it does make sense a little bit. And I, I do, I'm not a huge fan of the ending. Personally, I think it's the weakest point of the film and the weakest part about the movie. But, you know, if you go back and watch it, you can kind of see, and I do respect that, you know, early on in the movie, um, after you get that really cool fucking theater scene uh, where... You see our, our main character, I believe his name is David Hemmings. Uh, you see him uh, see the uh, psychic be um, decapitated in the window from the street. Whenever he you know runs up and he sees what's like supposed to be a painting on the wall. Um, if you go back after later on in the movie where you find out it's not a painting, it's a, a mirror that shows the reflection of the killer um, themselves, it is there. So, like, and, and they flashback in the movie, right? And the flashback is to, like, the actual roll of film that you see at the very beginning. So it's not like, you know, uh, a, a terror train type, type situation where you, you, they show a flashback and it's different than what you actually saw, but it's supposed to be the same thing. Um, so I respect that, but, you know, uh, upon my first viewing, and, you know, I got ADHD, so, you know, maybe I don't pick up on things right away, and I have to constantly watch things over and over again to further appreciate and look at every single little detail, whatever. Um, ultimately, even after piecing it all together and re-watching parts of it again to make it make sense, I still am not 
a huge fan. You know, in, in Friday the 13th, the original, obviously the killer ends up being a woman, just like in, uh, you know, this movie in Deep Red. Um, and I was okay with that. But in this one, and, and to be fair, in Friday the 13th, the kills are crazy, where you're like, no way a 60-year-old woman could do that. In Deep Red, the kills are not necessarily brutal, stabbing spears through people's necks and throwing people through windows. It's not necessarily physically imposing, but, you know, it is, it is a little surprising. Um, and the kills themselves, obviously I touched upon the gore. Um, you know, you have yourself a, a drowning, you have a decapitation, a throat slit, you have um, somebody getting their fucking like mouth and face rammed into a fucking like mantle, which in my opinion of the kills in which the killer executed, pun intended, that was probably the best one, I think, um, because that one truly is fucked, right? Um, but I think I, the, the thing I like about the killer the most, um, you don't really see a mask or any, you know, like tangible horror villain. Um, you know, in the other Giallo film I saw, that one of the coolest parts about that movie is the killer himself wears a fucking owl mask, right? There's no owl mask or any mask at all for the killer in Deep Red. Instead, you constantly are seeing these zipper leather gloves um, that are worn by the killer. Um, and in certain parts, in certain you know, uh, kill scenes, you'll see like the getup, but you obviously won't be able to, to um, make out necessarily what the killer looks like. They look like just, I don't know, a, a normal person wearing like a big leather trench coat. Um, and so once again, kind of leaving the, the character's identity ambiguous, it could be a guy, it could be a girl. I guess I can respect that in a way as well, but I don't know the, the leather glove and, and it's one of those ones where it sounds weird explaining it, but you have to kind of watch it, I think to really, really appreciate it, but the, they conceal the character's, um, identity really well, I will admit. Um, but the, the, like the dark leather gloves, um, I don't know. I feel like they, they stand out and they contrast with, you know, the bright, vibrant sets um, in this Giallo film. Um, and it definitely resonated and left, left an impact um, for me. And it kind of made up for the lack of, uh, you know, traditionally physically intimidating masked killer you would see in a Giallo or a normal slasher film, right? Um, which I thought was was pretty fucking cool, um, but uh, the in pro, not antagonist protagonist talked about the antagonist. The protagonist uh, himself, uh, when I saw him, I instantly thought of um, Gene Wilder. I thought he looked like him right away, or you know maybe like a '70s Paul McCartney. Um, and he's actually an English actor, one of the f very few non-Italian actors in this movie. Um, and he, he himself, and whether you want to say it's a societal, you know, um, sign of the times, but he's a bit of a he's a bit of a douche. You know, he's kind of a jerk, um, pretty misogynistic. You know, the scene where he's arm wrestling the journalist, who I guess essentially becomes a love interests at some point or you know it's it's one of those situations kind of like Courtney Cox character in Scream where she's just very desperate for information on this these murders that keep happening so you're like she's interested in him but also okay like she just really wants the story so she's kind of not manipulating him or necessarily leading him on but kind of going to drastic measures to get information but you know obviously towards the end of the movie they're kind of forced into saving each other's lives in a way, so that I guess they kind of force that, that, um, that love story, I guess, or, or romantic um, chemistry between the two, friction, um, if you will. But um, I don't know. He's kind of he's kind of whatever. I, I will say though that the actor did do a fantastic job, um, and he's not incredibly likable, but I do appreciate the performance. Uh, of of David Hemmings, uh, frankly, and, and the cast of characters, uh, for the most part, is is is, is pretty good. Um, I you know I didn't necessarily find myself uh, disliking 
or thinking anybody did a particularly bad job. Um, I, I did like the the character who I believe was the detective. He looked like like a fat Barry Gibb from the Bee Gees. Um, he I don't know. He had really cool hair. And he was in, very memorable, and he had probably the coolest death scene in the movie. Um, and in just a there are two very memorable gore sequences in this movie, and it's from the '70s, which is just so so fascinating to me. Um, cause like I said, when he gets fucking rammed in the mantle, oh my God, that shit fucked me up, bro. That shit is disgusting. Like, it, you know, there's not a lot of blood splatter. Just like to me, one of my biggest fears and, and I feel like some of the worst pain imaginable on so many levels is, you know, having your, your mouth be the, the point of bracing an impact of pain, whether that's hitting the ground, getting hit in the face with something, just because not only is it painful, but losing teeth for me is something that I'm terrified of and just having bad teeth. Um, and so that whole scene really fucked me up. Um, and then at the very end, obviously, another, like I said, a gore sequence, and I touched on this before, is the scene at the end where uh, after Claro is believed to be the killer, um, there's actually a really hilarious sequence. And I actually, uh, it was very amusing. Um, despite not necessarily being a complete fan objectively uh, of or, or as a whole when it comes to the ending. Um, the scene where he gets, where he's running away and he gets roped into uh, this like garbage truck. He gets like uh, hooked onto it and they're fucking, you know, straggling him around and he's like sitting there, you know, uh, rubbing up against the asphalt as the car is moving and dying and then you think he, that might be what ends up killing him, but then the car stops and his head gets fucking ran over by a truck. I mean, ooh, man. And shout out to, to Italy because there's no fucking MPAA to, you know, belittle the effects work that was done by whomever did the practical effects on this movie. I, I don't know. Was it Dario Argento? Probably not, but... Um, did a fantastic job. You know, if you would have told me this movie came out in 1985 and it was an American version of, it was an American film that Tom Savini did, I would have been like, that. yeah, that, that holds up. And this was made 10 years before. So absolutely awesome. Uh, awesome moment there. Um, and just, just great. I mean, the, the, the movie is a, is a very good giallo slasher uh, type movie that uh, is definitely um, one that... Uh, do I like it more than Stage Fright? I don't know. I think it. I think it's a better all-around movie than Stage Fright, but I don't know. Stage Fright is very memorable. It's not. I don't think it has as much depth as this movie, um, but Stage Fright's got a really memorable killer. It's got some cool kills. And it's got some really tense scenes, but they both have you know obviously really cool shots. Um, you know, whenever our main character, I, I forget his name. I'm really bad with names, which is just stupid because you're literally watching a movie the whole time and their names are constantly being brought up. But you still remember, you still somehow find a way to forget. Um, but whenever he goes to that abandoned house that is the scene of the murder from the very beginning, um, you know, there are some really, really cool shots um, from above that are, are really awesome. Just like in, you know, Stage Fright, you know, that whole sequence of the uh, masquerading of all the dead bodies on the stage um, with, you know, all of the feathers and, you know, holding the cat with the killer. Like that's, that's iconic. That is something that is etched in my brain, you know? Um, but, uh, nonetheless, also the dolls in this movie, um, two, two kind of random things that I wanted to, 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 to just mention, just cause I, I think that, uh, you know, when I go back to listen to this and, and remember this movie, you know, a years down the line, uh, the dolls in this movie, you know, you have, so a record player that plays like children's music, which is kind of weird. It's like a calling card. It's like, you know, the in Friday the 13th, you got the whenever the killer's on the screen. But in this, it's like you got that child, the, the children's music. Um, and you've got these fucking dolls that, that just kind of sprawl up um, periodically. And the, the scene in which our, our chubby Barry Gibb detective character, when he does get that, you know, like I said, appalling death scene with his face on the mantle, um, there is a freaky ass fucking scene, like shot moment, whatever, where there's like an animatronic dummy that comes walking in. That shit is fucking freaky. And it's weird and like it's not, it, it's very brief. 
Um, and he just ends up, you know, smashing it or whatever with like a, a, a knife and then he gets smashed with a fire poker, which is pretty funny. Um, but that, that's another one that's kind of etched in my brain. It is freaky, man. And, you know, there's some various little, um, uh, eerie little sounds or whatever, or, you know, there's sometimes there's like whispering of the killer. And once again, it's kind of unisex. You can't really tell what the if the killer is a guy or a girl or, or who the killer is, you know. Um, but uh, speaking of sound design, the other thing I wanted to mention, the music in this movie, the soundtrack, uh, I guess is performed by Goblin, who which is like an Italian prog rock band. And I did remember them from their inclusion in Dawn of the Dead because Dawn of the Dead was a George Romero film, of course, but there's a European version that was handled by Dario Argento. And so that's where that kind of clicked and that kind of made sense. But it was very strange because the, the music itself, and it's hard to explain, it's kind of out of place and it's kind of ridiculous. Um, and it doesn't necessarily hinder the movie's uh, you know, ability to be taken seriously, but it definitely was an eyebrow raiser and certainly unexpected, but also memorable. So, and, and the music's good. It's like, you know, up, kind of upbeat 70s prog rock music. Um, and just like with the, the child's, uh, you know, cassette or record player or whatever, it also seems to, um, you know, come on in the background whenever the killer's like stalking slash killing their victim. Kind of, kind of strange, but you know what? Hey, it's, it, it's different and, and I respect it and I remember it and it doesn't necessarily, it's not remembered for a bad reason. Um, but yeah, uh, no, it, it, in totality though, I think Deep Red's pretty awesome. Um, you know, it, when, if you look up the dictionary definition of a giallo film and read the traits, this movie has all of those in nice abundance. The ending, like I said, you know, it being uh, the character Carlo's mom, uh, you know, you see her throughout the movie and it kind of reminded me of Scream 2 where personally I think Scream 2 is every bit as good as the first Scream until the end. And the ending is, in my opinion, this movie's ending is, is, is better than Scream 2's ending. Scream 2's ending literally falls flat on his face. It's like getting, it's like doing a five point project, five part project, getting four out of four on everything and literally getting zero out of zero on the last one to give, a, to give you, you go from having an hundred on your project to an 80. That's how I feel about Scream 2. Just because the, you know, the character reveal in that movie is just completely off the wall. And not to say that the character reveal in this movie is as off the wall as Scream 2. And I know there was a script change in that movie, but you know, and going back, as I said before, going back and actually watching it, you can pick up and see like, okay, if you really piece it together, this makes sense. But to me, I just didn't really, I just didn't really like it that much. Um, but the ending itself though, had some, some memorable parts. See uh, Carlo's death getting run over. It's fucking hilarious and, and kind of impressive on the gore front. Uh, but yeah, no, I, uh, I'll give it a, a four out of five, I think. Um, you know, it's a, it's a great uh, giallo entry. And, you know, as somebody who's not seen many, it definitely, uh, you know, tickles my fancy to give more of these a shot. Uh, I would certainly, absolutely recommend this to horror fans. Um, and I would, honestly, I would like to see what film fans and or fiction fans think of this. Because, yeah, it is essentially a slasher. But the shots and, you know, the way that, Argento is able to manipulate the camera and add in some some tension. I think it's something that some artsy motherfuckers can appreciate. Uh, me, I appreciate it. I'm not necessarily an artsy motherfucker, but you know, I think that this this truly is a, a nice feather in the cap um, uh, for one of you know horror's biggest international uh, icons and, and directors. So, yeah, it's good. It's worth a watch. I enjoyed it.